And good afternoon. This is Marcus Hanscom, your online education chair for NAGAP. I just want to thank you all for joining us for another exciting webinar. Uh, we've really been trying to add some additional educational resources for uh, you, our members. And I know we have some visiting uh, folks here that are connected with Carnegie Communications, and we're thrilled today to have Melissa, Melissa Ricos, Vice President of Digital Services for Carnegie Communications, to join us. And just briefly, um, we will have uh, another webinar upcoming with Platform in September, so keep your uh, eyes on your inboxes for that, and we'll be having some continued webinars uh, beyond that. We also have currently our, our, our uh, proposals, um, our, our request for proposals is out for the NAGAP annual conference coming up in April. Uh, that will be in San Diego, so be sure to check your inboxes, and if you'd like to submit a session, we'd love to have you. And certainly, if you're interested in ever presenting a webinar to a national audience, we are certainly open to a variety of different topics if you're interested in doing that as well, and maybe a good alternative if you choose not to do something at the annual conference. So definitely uh, connect with us if you can. So we're very pleased to have um, Melissa with us from Carnegie Communications. Uh, she's going to talk to us today about is the stealth applicant headed to graduate school. And uh, for many of us on the graduate school side, we've certainly run into this issue and look forward to some of the information uh, that she'll be providing uh, to us. As Vice President of Digital Services, Melissa works closely with all regional directors on digital marketing and recruitment programs for Carnegie clients. And due to the partnership nature of her client relationship, she's involved in the strategic planning and design of digital marketing programs. As someone who still loves putting together puzzles, she truly enjoys the challenge of creating just the right program to meet each school's needs. And she oversees the implementation and execution of each digital project, as well as being involved in analysis and program evaluation. She is a regular presenter and a speaker, educating schools about online strategies and integrating them with traditional enrollment methods. Uh, she's been involved in the digital space since 1997 as a co-founder of the original teen.com. And she was instrumental in the growth and success of the business and the evolution within the teen market. In 2000, teen people recognized teen.com as a top teen website. And her passion and understanding of that audience continues today. And certainly, we're interested in some of the uh, great research and, and the work that they've done in digital marketing and, and Melissa's uh, regarded work in working with stealth applicants. Uh, just quickly, just so you know, if you have any questions throughout the session, please be sure to ask them in the questions box on the right side of your screen. And Melissa will be stopping periodically to answer any questions during the session. And also, we'll take questions at the end uh, in case you have any. Uh, she has graciously allowed for us to pass along the slides to you following the session. So we will email those out to you. And a video recording of this will be posted to the NAGAP YouTube channel. Uh, shortly after uh, the following of the session. So again, thanks so much for joining us. And at this time, I'll pass it over to Melissa. Hi, everyone. Welcome. And thank you so much for joining us. Um, and thank you so much, Marcus. Um, so j just real quick, um, just a, a a quick history on how this uh, webinar sort of even came to be. Um, we do a lot of work with um, both undergraduate and graduate programs uh, across the country. And, and what we were starting to hear a lot of was um, sort of some of the rumbles we were hearing you know, four and five years ago on starting to really percolate at the undergraduate level on this impact of stealth applicants. Um, and I've been dealing with um, graduate offices that I'm starting to see some of those same percolations of this concept. And um, we're even seeing it in some of the campaigns that we're running, you know, a little bit of, a little bit of frustration to some extent, um, but also just curiosity in, um, in terms of, you know, what's going on and, and what are we seeing in terms of those changes? And how do we, as marketers, as enrollment officers, um, and admissions counselors even, you know, how do we address some of these and, and, and what's this new landscape sort of look like? And that sort of developed into this concept of, you know, do we have, are we looking at the same students? Are they kind of aging through our system, if you will, aging through higher ed? Um, so that's kind of where this kind of came from, this concept. So real quick, you know, what exactly is the stealth applicant? And there's a lot of different ways of describing it, but I think a pretty pretty agreed upon description is that the student where the first point of contact with the school is the application itself. Um, you know, this, this is this whole notion of students not pursuing the, the traditional avenues that we like them to pursue, where they're filling out an inquiry form and having numerous discussions and, and really giving us the opportunity to engage with that student prior to the application coming through. So what did we see as the impact at the undergraduate level? Well, some of what we heard from the enrollment offices that we, we deal with um, was the frustrations with you know, the student's true interest level is a little harder to predict. 
um, you know, missed opportunities to contact and recruit the student directly and really sort of sell the student on those best benefits um, that might make that school a perfect fit for that particular individual. It also required that admissions offices really reevaluate their enrollment forecasting. It, it caused the old methods and the old percentages, if you will, and, and, and all that forecasting kind of had to be adjusted. And in some cases with schools that were seeing very high self-applicant rates in the 50s and 60s percentiles, um, you know, really had to adjust, um, you know, in terms of the number of applications that they accepted and in terms of how those students were yielding for them. And the studies show that the stealth applicants were often yielding at a lower rate. And that was due to several different factors, including that stealth applicants on average were applying to more schools. So obviously they're turning down more schools. But also, um, speaking back to our second point here, a lot of those opportunities for that contact and recruiting were lost. So a lot of times the student wasn't invested quite as heavily as a non-stealth applicant in that particular institution. So where we really started seeing this buzz hit um, the big boys, if you will, uh, the Chronicle of Higher Education published um, on March 31st of 2006, um, you know, a real um, very deep dive article into this rise of the stealth applicants and what type of impact that that was going to have. And again, this was focused on the undergraduate um, side. And March 2009, McGuire and Associates, who's actually located up here in Massachusetts, conducted a poll on what were they seeing as the impact of stealth applicants and undergrad admissions over the last 10 years. And you can see there that there was an increase uh, greatly um, in terms of how it was changing the process on how they were dealing with the stealth applicants. It also hit the New York Times, um, you know, in terms of, you know, in an era of admissions, you know, what was this, what was this impact happening um, in the admissions offices and how, was, um, how were individual schools starting to deal with it. And then NACAC, actually, the NACAC blog, um, which is called Admitted, um, Sarah Cox actually interviewed um, stealth applicants and reported on her findings in April 30th, 2012. This article was published. Um, and I highly recommend for any of you that either um, can use um, access through your undergraduate offices, this is a great article. Um, granted, it is focused on the undergraduate, but I think what you might find interesting about it is because it was interviews conducted directly with students, I think you'll see some direct correlations into the students that are now applying um, with you all as well. Um, so. One of the things that we really started conceptually looking at was, is the stealth applicant aging? Um, this was the Noel Levitt study that was published um, in 2010. Um, and you can see here the stealth applicant rate increase from 2008 till 2010. So this would be the graduate in class of 08 and the graduate in class of 2010. Well, if you look ahead to four years, obviously, to complete their undergraduate degree, and for those of you that are recruiting students coming directly out of high school. This is really the sweet spot of where you're recruiting right now. Um, so is there really um, a, a sort of a trend that we're seeing of these students aging through the system? And if so, does it stand to reason that these former undergraduate prospects would age and then elicit the same behavior in researching a graduate school that they elicited in researching at an undergraduate level? Why would they necessarily change their comfort level um, and become more interested in, in having those communications if they didn't participate in those communications early on in their undergraduate uh, work? So why would a student be stealth? You know, what, what really causes a stealth applicant internally as a student? And I think one of the things that, you know, in our industry we tend to forget is that they really don't necessarily have a full understanding of the benefits of contacting the school. Um, very often the way um, opportunities to contact the school are presented to them are, you know, for more information. Um, and in a world where there's just an abundance of information available at their fingertips, you know, how are we really communicating to these students that there's a benefit statement there, that there's some other reason other than just getting another piece of literature in the mail. Um, you know, really they don't necessarily understand that they're interfering with our processes. They really don't. 
Um, all of the information they need or think they need is now available at their fingertips online. Um, schools have done a fantastic job of providing all of that detailed information online. And as such, the students, as I mentioned, often don't feel like clicking on a request information is necessarily beneficial to them in any way. What more could they possibly need to know? They use multiple sources in the decision making through their research online. So they're no longer relying just on the information that comes from the school itself. Um, they're relying on third party information. They're seeking out videos on YouTube. They're seeking out former students who have something to say. So they're looking for those external sources of information um, that may not be found just from talking to someone in the admissions area at a graduate school that they're looking at attending. One of the things that came out of several of the interviews um, in that NACAC article that I referenced before um, is this concept of a fear of being judged. They haven't been accepted yet. Um, so, you know, being able, you know, there's a little bit of an apprehension in having a conversations with, having conversations with admissions offices where they might divulge some of um, something that maybe they feel might impact their application in a negative way. Um, so there's a little bit of fear of that, especially with a school that there maybe is a little bit of a stretch for them uh, to get into. And this is a generation that's now aged through who's, who are actually less likely to use in-person connections with strangers. They've grown up um, very capable of using technology as a buffer um, to that sort of in-person vulnerability that happens with someone they don't already uh, know really well. There is a mistrust of the information being given direct from the school. There is a sort of this feeling of they're all trying to sell me that they are the best. They're all telling me this is what they do so well or this is what they do so well. So um, there's a little bit of a mistrust there. So that's something else that we have to you know, sort of overcome a little bit and, and figure out how to make sure that they know that we're on their side and that um, there is somebody here to actually be an advocate for them in, as they sort of pursue what their future might entail. And there's also this interesting concept that they tend to feel that they are kind of bothering the contact at the school. And this sounds a little, a little odd as we sit on our side of the fence, but if you think about how often this generation, and perhaps even yourself, when you pick up the phone and you call a company nowadays, um, how often do you get the response of, well, all of that information is available on our website? Um, we've kind of grown up in an era now where that's a common response by commercial retailers. Um, you know, when we, we go to call an airline, we're going to deal with a, why don't you try going to our website first? And then if you really, really can't get an answer there, try and come back. And it's sort of this sensation that, that we get that we are bothering somebody by actually wanting to talk to a human. Um, so they've kind of grown up in that environment. So there is a little bit of apprehension that, uh, is this something I really need to contact somebody for? Or perhaps maybe I could just go on the website and try and dig up this information myself. So again, these things are all leading to sort of this, this behavior where you're not necessarily divulging who you are. And all of this allows them to stay insulated until they're ready to make a decision. No risk. They haven't really put themselves out there. They haven't really exposed themselves in any way to someone who could be um, taking notes on them or judging them or, or, or feeling bothered by their inquiry. Um, this was a great quote. This came from that article that I was um, referencing a moment ago. Um, the stealth applicants interviewed were mistrustful of information received from institutions, fearful of failure, aware of being judged and the risk of not measuring up, and deeply concerned about the impact of their decision. They were afraid of being perceived as annoying and mistrusting of information received from institutions. Um, again, this was specific to undergrad, but I don't see this, uh, these types of fears really changing all that much as a student ages up into the graduate population. Um, not unless we really take some active steps to change it. So some of the other contributing factors to what, what we've sort of termed around here as non-compliant prospects. And, and the reason I call them non-compliant prospects is um, as someone who's charged with 
um, overseeing marketing campaigns for colleges and universities, um, you know, we have certain things we want them to comply with. We have certain things we would like them to do um, to enable you all to track them better and to, to really follow those leads through your funnel and through your cycle and know what's happening with them. So when they don't do what we want them to do, we kind of call them non-compliant, um, also known as stealth. And there are a few other factors that come to play other than just the internal uh, things going on with that individual. First of all, they're always on. Research um, is very often being done in small increments as opposed to the sitting down for numerous hours at a time and really deep diving into um, an individual institution or, or across several schools. Um, you know, it's 15 minutes here, it's 20 minutes there, I've got a few, you know, I'm on my phone, I'm standing in line and I just saw a billboard, oh, let me go look that school up real quick, right? So, so it's being done in much smaller increments. Well, those small increments are not very favorable to completing inquiry forms or to picking up the phone and, and calling and getting on the school's radar. The rise of mobile as a key tool in education research, which is partially um, just you know, societal, obviously, but also where we are doing research in small increments of free time, it's our mobile device that's always on, that's always at our side, and so it enables us to look up a question that we may have um, really quickly. Um, another factor is how are you asking for their information? Um, we see this all the time. I grabbed a couple um, quick screenshots here from a few graduate schools that we work with. Um, and again, you see this recurring theme of request information, request information, request information. Um, and, and inevitably, that's the way contacting you is, is worded most often um, across the board. So again, the question is, how are we asking for their information? Well, what we really want is we want their information. But what we're asking them is, do you want more information? Um, and given the volumes of information you all are providing to them, very often a student may overlook this request information concept as, I eh, don't really need anything else. So, so again, you know, how can we um, sort of elicit that more as a benefit statement and figure out how to let them know that by requesting information or by giving their contact information, there is something else that we can do for them um, above and beyond sending them information. Are there other opportunities to engage other than a lengthy inquiry form? You know, are there ways that, that you can provide video engagement or, you know, registration for open uh, um, information sessions and things like that, obviously. But, but things that they can do that are more conducive to self-behavior, but do engage them further with your college or university. And the parental over-the-shoulder guidance has been removed very often by this point. Not completely. We're still hearing some of you, unfortunately, have to deal with parents still. but. For the most part, you know, the mom or dad sitting over the shoulder saying, no, you need to fill out an inquiry form. You need to tell the school who you are. And if you don't tell the school who you are, they won't accept you because they don't know that you're really, really interested. So some of that guidance and encouragement to get a student to follow traditional steps has been removed by the time you get to the graduate level. When we talk about consumers being all, always on, um, this, this was just um, a, a kind of a mind-blowing slide when you look at it from a percentage change. But when you look at what we're doing online, from paying bills to getting news online daily, obviously the impacts of things like YouTube and, and tweet, um, Twitter and Facebook, um, you see the volume of time we spend online ex just increasing exponentially. And this speaks to the fact that we are always on. Um, and this is especially true when you get to that graduate student. Um, the, they're very mobile and their um, device is always with them. So again, this is part of what's playing into those little short pieces of research that they're doing at a time. 2013 was, um, is expected to, and the numbers should be probably coming out shortly, was really expected to be this turning point um, in the U.S. and across the world where the number of smartphones and tablet sales combined um, was anticipated to actually supersede the number of desktops and note top, uh, notebooks sold um, annually. And you can see here by the, by the year 2015, it's expected to um, be almost double what will be sold for notebooks and PCs. So it really speaks to sort of the impact 
um, of mobile and the impact of laptop of um, tablets and what that's doing to what our audience is doing and how they're behaving. And a little bit of um, sort of this impact of mobile. Um, the prospective students can search on something that comes to mind immediately. Well, how does this impact you? Well, if you're running campaigns on either radio or television or billboard or something where somebody is most likely to be a little bit mobile um, at that time and, and you want to capture their attention and you want them to be interested in your program and you want them to go online and you want them to do a search, how many of those are coming to you via mobile? Um, because it's probably a number that if you're watching in your analytics, you're probably seeing that number increase exponentially from year to year. And they're doing this research on their mobile device. Um, and it's, it's sort of a catch-22. We're accomplishing what we want to accomplish. We're getting them to engage with us. We're getting them interested in us. And we're getting them to come to the site. But the question then becomes, are they able to do what we want them to do when they get there? Do you have a form that could realistically be found on your mobile site? If somebody becomes interested in you and they want to reach out to you, is that easy to find? Do you have a form that can realistically be completed on a mobile device? Realistically. Like, really? Would someone actually take the time to get there and work through the system and fill it out? And again, I stress this with our clients. Seriously, have you gone and have you done it? Have you actually seen how easy that is for somebody to do? Because if you are measuring campaign success or even um, sort of measuring in aggregate your marketing success based on driving those leads and driving those inquiry form completions or registrations for information sessions, if that's the basis on which you're doing some, some judgment, some decision making, you have to walk through this process. Find out what it's actually going to feel like for somebody. Because in a lot of ways, we're kind of contributing to the rise of this problem. It's, it's, it's already a trajectory that we're not going to be able to stop. But we can do things um, to potentially improve the, the experience, if you will, for those students who are trying to be compliant and are trying to do what we want them to do. So are we contributing to the problem? And if there's anyone on here from Arizona State University, I promise I am not throwing Arizona State University under the bus. I'm really not. As a matter of fact, they have a fantastic um, mobile website. They've done an excellent job um, in, in producing something that allows potential students or, or even other stakeholders in the university to go and, and function very well on mobile. The reason I'm using them as an example is most schools don't have the budget um, of something like an Arizona State University and, and don't have access to be able to maybe do something this well. And yet, even with being able to do something this well, what we still saw um, when I went in here was what I'm going to show you. And this is what I mean by you really have to kind of walk through the process um, as a potential student. So I scrolled down. Um, and, and in this particular case, I went in as somebody who was looking for a graduate program in their um, College of Liberal Arts and Sciences. So um, I clicked on Colleges and Schools. I clicked on Liberal Arts and Sciences. Um, went to a great, and again, great mobile, great mobile site for, for gathering information. Um, clicked on Graduate Studies. Um, I then uh, received this page, which then I clicked on the contacting the graduate office uh, graduate college office because I wanted to actually potentially give up my information and get some information sent to me, um, which led me at this point off of what is a truly mobile site. And this is very normal um, in mobile development. Um, clicked on prospective students, clicked on request info, um, and finally got to a place where I could actually request info. Um, and then a form that I could actually scroll down and, and, and fill out. So my point with this exercise is that um, they're doing it really quite well. So the question is, you know, how are the rest of us doing it? Are we, are we making this an easy process for a student to do if they are coming in on a mobile device? And are we giving those applicants who potentially don't want to be stealth, are we giving them every opportunity possible to 
do what we want them to do and do it quickly and easily within the time frame allotted, or would a student be more likely to sort of fall off somewhere along the way and say, oh, I'll do this later? And, and potentially a missed opportunity um, for us to gather that student's information. So the landscape is really changing. It's, it's, this is not something, you know, no one's going to sit here, and certainly not myself, and say that there's a way to um, get out of the way of the stealth applicant issue. It's, it's growing. It's increasing. We see it at the undergraduate level. Um, and therefore, most likely, it's going to continue through the graduate level. So with the landscape changing, you know, how do we hold on to the tradi traditional methods and yet accommodate for these changes? How do we still look at the lead generation services and still look at the ways that we want to track what's working for us? But how do we also um, evolve? Um, and as technology continues to expand and the generation that you know, doesn't know life without an iPhone heads to graduate school, how is it going to continue to evolve? And how do we begin to look at the future and, and, and kind of prepare a little bit um, internally for what we see coming? Um, are we at risk of misinterpreting the success or failure of marketing and outreach efforts? Um, we speak to clients about this all the time because it's really, if, if you're only measuring on some of those traditional lead generation methods, are you missing some opportunities to see what's really going on just simply because we're trying to measure it the old way, if you will. Um, and we still measure things the old way, but there are a lot of new ways to measure things as well and sort of see that impact so that we don't, you know, quintessentially throw the baby out with the bathwater and potentially give up some marketing effort we may be doing or, or some programming we may be running because we think it's not working because it's not generating the traditional one-to-one-to-one -to -one -to -one lead ratio of, of, you know, following directly through, but there might be other ways that it is impacting in a positive way. And, and how do we look at that so that we don't misinterpret and we don't make a decision based on incomplete data? There's very little information out there at the graduate level regarding stealth applicants. Um, an interesting thing sort of happened to me as, as I was doing some research for this particular webinar, and what I found was when I Googled stealth applicant graduate school, um, what came up number one was the promotion of this webinar, um, just to give you an idea. Um, and while I think that's great, and, and I'm, I'm thrilled that, that that promotion happened for an AGAP, at the same time, what that tells us is there's just not a lot of information out there. Not a lot of data has been gathered yet at this graduate level. So, so moving forward, um, that also makes it a little bit more difficult on people in your positions to, to really kind of get an understanding of, you know, how do we deal with this. Um, so one of the things that, that I suggest is, are there lessons to be learned from the undergraduate offices at your institution? You know, how did they evolve some of their methods? What changes did they make? How did they adjust for this? How are they compensating either in their enrollment models or in their marketing methods? You know, what types of things are they doing? Because they're probably some of the best research you're going to have, and it's right internally on your campuses. So, you know, really tapping into them um, would probably be really helpful. I know in campaigns we run, we tap into some of the lessons learned at the undergraduate level for the graduate level as well. Um, and I think um, that's something that you may or may not have, have tapped into yet on your campus. So what do we do? So traditionally, lead efforts measured the one-to-one -one interaction. In other words, I go to a, you know, if I, let's say, for example, I were running an a online campaign. Um, what I ideally want to happen, right, is I'm going to see an ad, I'm going to click on an ad, I'm going to go to a customized landing page or, or some particular page where I can track it. So the ad plus the inquiry form completed equals a lead. And that is somebody I can now source, and I can track them through. And at the end of the day, I can say that that particular program that I ran gave me these particular very specific students. And in an ideal world, that's great. But what we're seeing is that while that final conversion may be what actually got measured, what we now know is that in this world of a lot of noise and a lot of marketing, both traditional and online, um, the conversion might get attributed to the last touch, but it really takes a lot of other influencers 
to set up that conversion. And especially when we're talking about the graduate level where someone is older, more mature, and a little bit more savvy, they're also going to do um, a lot of talking to peers, to coworkers, to potentially employers, to family members. They're going to do a lot of that kind of research too. So there's a lot of input going on that you don't see that is part of that stealth decision. And one of the best analogies that we make for these sort of multiple touch points is my basketball court analogy, which basically is the concept that, you know, it takes everyone on the team. So someone has to throw the ball in, and there has to be a passing off to move this ball down to where that final score, that final conversion can occur. And very often, this is an aggregate. This might be a billboard you're running. It might be banner ads you're running online. It might be a pay-per-click campaign you're running online. It might be a whole lot of work by your web development team with a search engine optimization company. It may be the pieces that you're mailing out. Somewhere along the way, there's that final conversion that actually puts the ball in the basket, if you will causes the application to occur. But what you don't see is all these other things that are going on behind the scenes before that occurs. Um, now, in digital marketing, there are a lot of ways now that we can track a lot of that. There's, there's some, um, Google has made great strides in terms of um, creating attribution models and things like that that can help you um, with tracking what you're doing online so that maybe you can see some of the stealth behavior even though you may not necessarily have a name um, to attribute that to. So you don't get to source it in the old-fashioned way, but you do get to get a feel for what's going on with those stealth applicants behind the scenes. So what can we really implement and measure now? You know, what has changed that um, are some potential ways to work within this new landscape? Um, one of the, the biggest things that um, you know, we talk to clients about doing is you know, making sure that campaigns that you're running, um, whether you know, that's with an agency you're working with or something internally that you're doing, um, the customized, you know, th this concept of um, you know, sort of a customized sourced landing page that enables you to know that the only way someone got to that page was by going through some very specific channel. Um, and that's great. Um, and it does allow you to kind of get that attribution the old school way, you know, where that lead came from that one specific source. But more and more with stealth applicants rising, what we see is that's just not the behavior elicited by the majority of your prospects. The majority of the prospects are going to see something that you might be doing and they're going to organically navigate to those information pages on your website. And what I mean by that is they're going to start at the Google search engine, and they're going to type in the name of your institution, or they're going to type in that I'm looking for an MBA program in the state of Texas, whatever the case may be, but they're going to begin at that sort of organic native search. And then they're going to organically navigate through your own site to get to where they need to be. And then they may still fill out an inquiry form or they may not, but they need to be able to organically navigate themselves to somewhere that you want them to go. And by, by having them do that, now you have access to your own data internally inside your analytics to sort of track some of that behavior that's going on by stealth applicants. So that even if they're not filling out an inquiry form, you can at least see what they're doing. You can see how those engagements are working. You can see how they're going from one particular area to another particular area on your site, and whether or not they're actually flowing the way you want them to flow inside of that. And you can see what a stealth applicant is doing, even though you may not know who the name of that student is. And one of the things that um, some of you may or may not have ever heard of is something called a view-through conversion. And if you're ever running any type of an online marketing campaign, um, this basically builds on what I was just talking about. There are actually ways now um, to place tags on your site that enable you to know if someone has seen an ad or, or engaged um, somehow um, online with an online marketing effort that you had 
and they didn't click on the ad. They didn't click on the paid ad. They didn't click on the banner ad, whatever ad, you know, whatever you might be doing. They didn't engage with it directly, but they came back around through your front door and then later went on to complete some type of key action, whether that was, you know, viewing a video or registering for an information session or potentially completing an inquiry form. But whatever those actions on key pages are, you can actually um, register those and count those. And you can actually see what that impact is, even though they didn't sort of do it in the perfect way, you can track some of the measurements of those campaigns and things that you might be doing. Um, some of the downside of this, again, there is no name attached. So it's, it's changing the thinking a little bit and, and obviously still wanting to do that direct one-to-one -one lead generation. But this is a great way of augmenting um, what you might be measuring so that you can see what those stealth applicants are doing. Again, not going to have a name attached. However, you can measure the engagement and behavior of the stealth prospect. They're on your site. They're there. It's just a matter of learning how to interpret what you're seeing and how to um, really measure inside your own site. It's your own data and how to really know what to be looking for in there. You can use strategies such as retargeting to bring pro, um, prospects back to your site and engage further. Um, for those of you that don't know what that is, it's, it's basically a, it's a technology that allows you to um, basically almost tag people who've been to your site before and then get back in front of those people after they leave your site. So you can do something like that. Um, one of the great parts about that is that Google studies have shown that the greater the number of visits to your site, the more likely that you are to have a conversion. This is Google's data, um, and it basically showed that 87% of the people that converted, which basically conversion in, a, in Google speak means they did some type of action that you wanted them to do, sort of engaging at that next level. 87% of them had to visit the site at least twice before they converted. But you can see that the more times you bring them up back to your site, the more likely you are to get that conversion. So bringing that prospect to re-engage with you over and over, whether that's through watching a video or, again, you know, ideally inquiring, um, but whatever that action is you want them to complete, Getting them to come back to your site as often as possible, creating reasons for them to re-engage with you is going to potentially increase the probability that you might be able to get them to sort of unveil themselves to you a little bit, if you will, um, and potentially maybe some of the, make some of those stealth applicants come out. Um, also, like we discussed, you know, consider how you're asking for information. You know, what's the benefit? How can we um, you know, restate what we're looking for um, and, and really make students understand that there's a, there's a direct benefit to them by reaching out to us um, and identifying who they are. And again, none of these are actually going to eliminate the stealth applicant problem. We're just trying to figure out ways that we can take what's been learned um, through some of the trials and tribulations of the undergraduate side and bring those over to the graduate side and, and, and see if we can change how we ask for the information. The undergraduate side, we're seeing schools say things like, um, you know, instead of requesting information, they might say something like um, a little bit longer of a statement that's, you know, talk to one of our counselors, let us help guide you, you know, things like that. We're seeing more and more of that sort of uh, communicative uh, messaging as opposed to just you know, request information. So think about how you might be able to do that. How can you talk to a student about what you can offer them if they reach out? And then analytics, 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 I can't stress this enough. Um, the data that's inside your site um, will help you understand where students are going and where the roadblocks might be occurring on your site, where you might be losing an opportunity to gain a student's information. So by changing a little bit about how you measure um, what you're doing and looking inside your own analytics, in addition to looking at those direct lead sources, um, but also looking at your own site and, and the fact that you already are sitting on this data and, and how can you use this data to unveil um, potentially more opportunities to collect a student's information in some way. Um, if you see that 
you know, a certain percentage of the people who come into your site are hitting your inquiry form, but the percentage that are actually completing it is really low. You know, look at ways that you can actually um, optimize that potentially. If you're asking 15 questions, maybe you only need to ask four. Um, and you can make those changes, and then you can watch inside your analytics and see if it begins to have an impact. Um, if you start to see a positive impact, then great, then you know that's working. And again, it's no longer guesswork. It's in your analytics. There are ways to, to, to measure all of that right inside there. So, so think about um, how you can you know, potentially use some of that data um, that you already are sitting on top of. And so that's basically my presentation. I wanted to leave a little time at the end for um, if we had any questions. Um, thank you so much, everybody, for joining us. And I hope that this is, you know, I hope this was helpful to you. And I hope we can, um, you know, maybe start some, some dialogues and some conversations um, moving forward about um, how South applicants are rising in graduate schools. And, you know, we're, we talk directly to universities all the time, but I think it's, um, I think it's fascinating to, you know, get NAGAP directly involved and, and see if, um, you know, we can really start to, uh, you know, pull together, um, as a, you know, in the industry and, and um, maybe potentially even lead to some, some additional research um, on this. But um, I'm going to kind of toss it back to Marcus. He's got um, access to the question window. So if anybody has any questions, I'm happy to, we've got like 10, 15 minutes, so I'm happy to answer any questions I might be able to help with. Melissa, it was great. Thank you so much for your information, and uh, we're glad to have you uh, joining forces with NAGAP, and certainly like to see further opportunity for that in the future. Um, there is a question. Well, it looks like more like a general statement. Are, here, are there any suggestions for rewording for more information, and are there any schools that you feel are doing this particularly well? Yeah, I, I think I think we've seen um, things like. Um, uh, allow us to help you with your search or allow us to provide more information to you about, you know, it, it, it's, unfortunately they don't always fit on a button and they don't always fit in a navigation. Um, so, so more of a reach out, more of a um, identify yourself. I've seen some schools use that terminology. Um, it depends a little bit on whether or not you are able to construct it in a, in a text way on the page or if it's in your nav. If it's in your navigation, like a couple of those that I showed, it's a little bit more of a struggle. But I think, you know, if you can get a little brainstorm together, it's, it's interesting um, what people come up with. Okay, and it looks like um, there's one general statement from one of our uh, attendees. We're a grad school with a large university and have 80% stealth applicants defined uh, as within their prospect mailing list for years, and they've had no movement despite all of their aggressive efforts. Wow. Um, and it, it certainly, at least from my own, if I'll add an anecdote, just from a lot of the people that I've talked to through NAGAP, we're experiencing generally in the nature of 50% in many cases, and that's pretty common mm -hmm. uh, for a lot of institutions, at least on the private school level um, that I'm interacting with. Um, there is a question here regarding international versus domestic. Have you seen any significant dis dis difference between, you know, in terms of research or working with clients that shows that there's a difference between stealth applicants on either side? Yes, we actually have. On the international side, we see um, much, um, we find that international students are much more willing to be compliant um, and to fill out inquiry forms. I think some of the, I hate to use the word jaded, but I think some of that more skeptical nature of filling out forms is an American, is, is more of an American phenomenon than it is an international phenomenon. It varies by country, um, but generally speaking, we do see higher inquiry form completion rates internationally than we do domestically. Okay, and there's a question here regarding analytics. I know you've touched a lot on it here, but um, Derek asks, how do we know who is a stealth prospect versus another on my website um, versus somebody you know that I may have met previously and is now coming through the pipeline? Mm -hmm. You don't really know specifically who is who, but what you can do is you can see your traffic. 
So um, if you're seeing, for example, that generally speaking, you're, say you're running a campaign and you're seeing increases in, in traffic to certain pages, some of those might be self and some of those might be students who've identified themselves to you. But if you know you have a certain number of unique visitors hitting a particular key page, um, you also know how many inquiry forms were completed in any given time. And so it starts to kind of give you an idea of, you know, of the number of people that are coming um, in a given month to my particular area, and, and especially hitting key pages that, are, that show a little bit more engagement and interest. And I'm only seeing, you know, a certain real small percentage of actual inquiry form completion. Well, that tells you you have some, some potential opportunity there to, um, to speak to those people a little bit more and, and potentially try and get them to, to engage with you at the next level, whether that's a phone call or whether that's, you know, an inquiry form completion, like we said, or, or maybe it's watching a video and it's just, just getting more engaged and, um, and in tune with the school. One of the other things that you can do inside your analytics now um, is you can actually set up, they have what are called advanced segments. And it's actually a little button when you're looking up the traffic inside your analytics. And you can actually go in and select new versus returning visitors. Um, and what's fascinating about that is that if you're looking at only return visitors, for example, you might see a little bit different traffic patterns. And sometimes return visitors kind of gives you an idea of those stealth people that are moving around in your site because they've been back more than once. And the more often they've been back, you can kind of look at how that behavior changes. And if you see a large volume of um, prospects that are, that are coming in that are return visitors, and you see where they're going, and you're not seeing um, certain action completions, that gives you kind of an idea that you, you have this audience out there. So it's not specifically, you know, Jane Doe is a stealth and John Smith is not, um, but from, a, from an aggregate of, of numbers and, and the volume you see, you can kind of see that behavior inside your analytics. Yeah, there was also one other general statement um, from the woman who was coming from the large institution with 80% stealth. She mentioned here that she, she was reiterating that her international students do seem to be more compliant but they aren't necessarily greater or, or stronger prospects, um, even though they are going through that, that chain. So just an interesting observation from her there. Mm -hmm. We also find that in digital campaigns, they click a lot more. They, <laughs> they click on ads a lot more, um, you know, which is you know, a good thing, bad thing. Um, but they do tend to click on ads a little bit more, and they do tend to get a little bit more engaged. And I, I think some of that might just be the perception that if they are overseas, they do need to engage a little bit more. Um, in order, you know, to, they might have more questions, first of all. It's a usually a little bit more complicated um, of an application process. They may have questions that require human action and, and, and intervention. So um, I think that's some of the reason. But we also see them even just engaging at the click level. Um, a lot more we see higher click-through rates on digital campaigns over there, um, both on the pay-per-click side as well as like things like banner ads and stuff like that. All right, well, it looks like we got through, I think, all of our questions. If there are any further questions, certainly feel free to answer them now. Uh, but at this point, I think we're pretty much all set. So, Melissa, thank you so much for your time today and for all of your valuable information. Uh, as I mentioned to all the attendees, we will post the recording of this video on our YouTube channel for NAGAP. So watch your inbox for that. We will send you an email with follow-up information how to get the slides and get the recording. And we'll also send you a brief survey. If you could take the time to not only fill it out about this session, but we'll have a couple of questions related to your own experiences with stealth applicants. We'd love to just get a little bit of a pulse on what you're experiencing at your campuses so that we can develop further research. And I know Carnegie wants to uh, invest some resources in determining if that's really something that we can uh, look into a little bit more in depth and get some really valuable information. So again, Melissa, thank you so much for your time. Thank you all for your time this afternoon and for joining us. And we look forward to seeing you at future webinars. Uh, make sure to watch in Inbox for our next webinar with platform. Uh, it should be the middle of September. So thanks so much and enjoy the remainder of your summer. Thank you, everyone.